Moving right along, we um, now have two speakers from Taylor Run Monitoring Team with us today. I'm going to introduce Bill Gillespie and Russ Bailey. Bill Gillespie has a BS in Chemistry from the College of William and Mary and graduate work in business at George Washington University. His career involved counterfeit deterrence work at the U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing and air quality work at the Department of Environmental Quality. Bill is a member of the Tree Stewards of Arlington and Alexandria and a volunteer with the Arlington Medical Research Corps and the George Washington Memorial Parkway. Russ Bailey retired from a 40-year law career four years ago, and since then he has worked on numerous tree plantings and park maintenance projects in Alexandria and Arlington. So welcome, Bill and Russ. Okay, I'm Russ, um, and I'm going to tell you uh, why we got involved with this water monitoring project, and Bill's going to tell you what we found uh, when, when we did our project. Uh, Taylor Run. Taylor Run's a little stream. It's, uh, uh, I guess, a watershed of uh, the not Dabisco stream was, uh, was uh, approximately 40 times the watershed of, of Taylor Run. We have 275 acres. But a stream that runs, if you've been through Alexandria, you would never know this stream is there, even though it runs right down the middle of the city, right past the city high school. And there's a woods there, one of the few woods that we have in, in the city. It's almost a forest in there. And there's a wetland in there, which, which I'll mention more about in a minute. Um, so the background on this project is that uh, the city, like every other jurisdiction in the Potomac wa uh, watershed, has an obli or in the Chesapeake Bay uh, catchment area, has an obligation to reduce the nutrient flow into the Chesapeake Bay. And so everybody's looking around for ways to do that. And one of the ways a lot of jurisdictions have taken up is the stream restoration programs. They call them stream restoration. Uh, we call them stream reconstruction uh, because they don't really restore the streams. Uh, but uh, there are probably 100 and 150 of those projects that have been done in the Washington metropolitan area. Uh, on this one, um, the city planned to do this little, little stream, 1,900 feet, um, and it was... Um, the idea was they had a target number of, of uh, nutrients, and we'll get to that in a, in a minute. Um, okay, let's see. There's a stream, and where's our next slide? Let's see. Pardon? Did it come up? Okay, oh, we just had that. Am I going the wrong direction here? Yeah, okay, okay. Um, and so we're going to point out is that uh, stream restoration, we do not believe it will improve the uh, water quality of Chesapeake Bay. Um, and that there are other alternatives to, uh, to reducing nutrient flow in, in, into the Chesapeake. And as a result, some of the work that we've done, the city's now identified those alter alternatives, and we hope that they're going to pursue those alternatives rather than do this stream. This is one of three streams they plan to do. There are two others, Strawberry Run and Lucky Run, all small streams, inter ur urban, urban streams. Um, okay. And, okay, so there it is, the uh, proposals for those streams. And that's here, it's gonna be affected. And here's, uh, the plan was for Taylor Run, it's gonna be 1,900 feet long. 75 feet wide, 75 feet wide, uh, wide enough to you know, land a uh, Cessna aircraft in there. And they're going to take down about 250 trees, and they're going to you know, affect the uh, uh, wildlife communities in there, the natural communities. And also, the key thing they're, they're going to, they were going to affect, the, street, uh, the project was going to run right along a small wetland in there, and that wetland happened to have 25 Alexandria rare species of of plants in there. So that's what first caught our attention. Um, so the question is, well, our question was, why do this stream restoration? Oops. Let's see. And the city said, okay, we're reducing phosphorus, nitrogen, and, and sediment. 
And they had a number. Uh, they had numbers that they put into their grant application. And the one thing I might mention is they came down there, got their grant from the Department of Environmental Quality before they came to this uh, community for discussion. Uh, and uh, th that's changed up in Northern Virginia now. The Arlington, Alexandria now talk to the community before they seek their, seek their grants. Uh, so they came back and they had, a, they had these numbers for, um, for um, the amount of nutrients that they thought were gonna, the project was going to bring out. Um, and I'm, I'm going to follow up on that idea before I go to this. Um, and the numbers they had, interestingly enough, and they were permitted to do this. Um, they're no longer permitted to do this, but they were permitted to use nutrient numbers from streams up in Pennsylvania. Different landscape, different environment, different soils, agricultural versus urban. Um, and th this was just simply permitted. Um, and so our thought was, wait a minute. We bet that, this, that the uh, numbers aren't as high in Alexandria as they are in Pennsylvania. And so um, we did soil samples. And the soil samples showed that the actual nutrients in the soil were approximately one-fifth of the estimated numbers that were, the grant was based on. Uh, and so that's a dubious. Um, Dubious numbers based on the Pennsylvania stream. Um, they estimated uh, basically a pound of phosphorus per ton of sediment. We showed it was about one, uh, one fifth of a pound. Um, um, and so then we decided, so we had these numbers. And first, at this point, city stops the project. They say, wait a minute. They told their, and they asked their staff to go out and do their own soil samples and also work with the community on alternatives. Um, the city went out, did its own, own soil, soil samples. They got exactly the same numbers that we had, one-fifth of the amount that they're estimating in the grant application. Um, and then we decided at this point, well, let's also take a look not only what's in the soil, but what's actually in the water. Uh, and let's do water monitoring <coughs> and test how much nutrients being picked up in this stream segment, because the city's position was that what they, the numbers that were supposedly being reduced were numbers that were being generated on this 1900 foot stretch of the stream. It wasn't coming from upstream, they weren't counting for anything from upstream, it's only it was being generated in the segment. So we said, let's take a look at the segment, then we take a look at what are the nutrient levels at the top point of the 1900 feet, and what are the nutrient levels at the bottom, and Bill will tell you what we found. Let me try using this mic. I'm a bit of a wanderer. Oh, okay, very good. So uh, before going further on the slides, I'd just like to point out uh, a big thanks to DEQ for providing this $5,000 grant. That was huge. That allowed us to do a lot of really significant water quality monitoring on Taylor Run. Otherwise, we would have had to come up with that money from individuals, pretty much. And then I have to give a huge plug to the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and Liz. I mean, they were just so helpful in terms of training us and getting us the equipment we needed to do the water quality monitoring that you're going to hear about here in a minute. Well, let me see if I can control the slides here. Yeah, okay. So here's our, uh, some of our Motley crew. Uh, these are the people that volunteered uh, to do the actual monitoring. And we monitored from uh, March uh, through October of 2021. And uh, so we made these water quality measurements. They were made at two sites twice a month. So we did the second and fourth Tuesday every month. And as Russ was pointing out, we measured at the upstream end of the stream restoration proposed project and at the downstream end. So we wanted to you really understand what's coming into the stream at the head of this restoration project and what's going out you know, at the end of this project. 
and try to understand, is the stream contributing to these nutrient pollution loads, or is it really coming in from the watershed? So that was the basic concept of the project. So we measured air, water temperature, pH, conductivity, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, all these things that the Alliance helped us measure. And most importantly for the nutrient load uh, issue was we wanted water samples taken at both the upstream and the downstream site twice a month to capture the total nitrogen, the total phosphorus, and the total sediment uh, at those locations. And the reason why those pollutants are important is those are the Chesapeake Bay nutrient pollution, uh, uh, the important pollutants for the Chesapeake Bay. So most of the year, and uh, those of you who you can't hear me. Okay, let me. Can you hear me now? Well, I have to swallow this mic to get. Okay, is that better? Yes. All right, I'll try to speak a little louder too. So, uh, for those of you who know urban streams, most of the flow is like this uh, most of the time. If you don't have a rain event, this is the beginning of Taylor Run. It comes out of a storm sewer culvert. Uh, very close to uh, the Chincapin uh, Recreation Center in Alexandria. And most of the time, really, it's just a trickle. It's really, really pretty, pretty slow. But during these big rain events that we've already heard about this morning, it can be quite a torrent. And in fact, I've kidded I could probably kayak on the stream at some points. But these infrequent but powerful high water events, they really occur during these heavy rains, and it all comes out of the storm sewer system. So we sampled uh, at high and low water, and this is Russ here on the left. You might think he's looking for the Loch Ness Monster or something there. But actually, he's trying to read a stream gauge because he didn't want to get in the creek, and I wouldn't want to get in there either with the water roaring like it was. And we did this for eight months. OK. So here's some data. And I apologize in advance for the busyness of the slide. But I hope you'll, you know, look at this uh, at home or something, because this shows uh, our, our data for nitrogen, for total phosphorus. So um, let me try to use this pointer here. Well, I'll just tell you what, what we're looking at. So that yellow line at the bottom is the analytical detection limit for this test. So anything below that, you know, you, you wouldn't know what you're getting. Uh, the green line is what DEQ measured for nitrogen about uh, half a mile south of uh, where we measured. The red line is what came out of that pipe. That's the upstream monitoring site. The blue line is the downstream monitoring site, uh, the nitrogen levels there. So the takeaways are, you can see the blue line is almost always above the red line, which indicates that the downstream site does often have a little more nitrogen in the water than the, than the red line, the, the upstream site. But it's also important to see that about 75% of the nitrogen comes into the stream at the upstream site. So that's that red line. You see the red line moving up and down over the course of time. You can see that the blue line is a little bit higher, but a lot of the, a lot of the nitrogen, that red line, comes in from the upstream site. And I probably should have started and said, so concentration is on the vertical axis here in um, milligrams per liter, and time is what's going on in the uh, horizontal axis there from March until October of 2021. Okay. So in big, I should note a couple of bullets here, the big, in big rain events that are circled there, you find the concentrations are fairly similar. And the reason we think that's so is the water's roaring through the creek so fast, it doesn't have time to change concentration very much because the concentration upstream and 1,900 feet farther downstream is pretty much the same. Anyway, we thought it was interesting that downstream, the concentration that DEQ measured was lower still. So if you were gonna do a stream restoration project on this section of the stream, you wouldn't be getting these nitrogen reductions for the Chesapeake Bay because downstream the numbers are even lower. So this really made us think that stream restoration project was not gonna help us with nitrogen. 
So here's phosphorus, again, another one of the Chesapeake Bay pollutants. And here it's really obvious that the red line is almost always significantly higher than the blue line. Again, the red line indicating what's coming into the stream, the blue line indicating what is downstream. So you can see in all these events over time, the phosphorus is coming in from the watershed. It's not originating in the stream. So. And then similarly here for uh, total suspended sediment, you know, sediment in the water, you see sort of the same behavior. Most of the time when the water flow is low, the stream, you can even go down to the stream and see that there's very little sediment in the stream. It's pretty clear. We did turbidity testing, which would show this. But in these big rain events that are uh, showed in circles there, you can just imagine you have all that impervious uh, surface upstream in the watershed, roadways and so on. You get a big rain event, and much like Tim Hughes was saying, not only does the trash go down the stream, but all that accumulated debris on all the roadways and your rooftop and wherever else, it suddenly gets charged into the, the storm sewer system and it shows up in the creek. So that's kind of the story there. So this is pretty much what I've already told you. This is sort of a summary of our chemical testing. Phosphorus, it's almost all from the watershed and so on. So the bottom line here in this slide is the one I think we all already know. More uh, can and should be done to keep these pollutants out of the stream from even getting there in the, from the stormwater system. So we also did these macro and uh, vertebrate studies. Um, a big credit to the Isaac Walton League uh, for helping us with that. They trained one of our uh, members, one of our volunteers, and uh, she, she guided us through this. Here you can see us out in the creek uh, with our table uh, on a summer day. And uh, the, the city of Alexandria hired Wetland Studies Solutions as their uh, stream restoration contractor, design team anyway. And Frank Graziano in a public meeting said, anything living there, meaning Taylor Run, will have trouble surviving and you will not find any mayflies. So that challenged us. <laughs> and as you might guess, sure enough, there were mayflies in Taylor Run, along with a whole bunch of other uh, macroinvertebrates which we carefully cataloged and so on. It is an Im impaired stream though, uh, I would say that. It's certainly not some pristine uh, stream out in uh, Glacier National Park. So we're fair about this. You know, we're not just a bunch of environmental crazy people. Um, we think uh, the, the stream does need work, no question about it. On the left, you can see here a sanitary sewer line that actually goes you know, across the creek in a pipe. Some of the banks in the center there do need to be protected from erosion. And certainly the park needs to better stormwater control. This is a trail on the far right there. Uh, this is normally just a walking trail and in a big rainstorm, it just becomes a stream, you know, like a tributary to uh, Taylor Run. So again, sort of the similar thing here, footpaths need to be you know, somehow worked on so that the water is slowed down or diverted uh, or absorbed. And the city has also not maintained its curb and gutters on a road above the park. Here you can actually see a piece of the concrete um, gutter has fallen off and the erosion that has uh, resulted uh, because they're not controlling the water. And then there's a lot of paved surfaces so all these things could improve the park. This is another shot of the park. And this is sort of the good news story in this case, um, where there actually is room for best management practices. They have huge space here where you could have many of the things that other speakers have talked about, you know, bioswales, bioretention ponds, rain gardens, and so on. So there is this space. And uh, we'd love to see those things happen. They could actually catch the trash, as Tim was talking about, you know, before it even got in the creek. So again, kind of a lot of information here. This is something you probably want to look at if, if you get home or have the interest. 
But basically what we're showing here is in this uh, first column of numbers, this is what they estimated using those Pennsylvania uh, numbers. They used this um, bank erosion hazard index engineering method for calculating what they think they're going to get in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reductions. The next column, the middle column, shows the numbers based on actual soil samples and the reduction going from the bank hazard index numbers to the uh, soil samples, you, you know, they're 20% less or 20% of, of what they originally estimated, 30% for phosphorus or 31% for phosphorus, and only 66.7 of sediment. So the point is you've got to do measurements if you want to know what kind of you know, reductions you're going to get. And better still, not only should you do like these stream bank samples, you should do water quality measurements because if it isn't going to get in the water, it's not going to get in the Chesapeake Bay. And so we found there's a huge difference between what you sample in a stream bank and what actually gets uh, transported to the Chesapeake Bay. So stream bank sampling is inexpensive, so we really want to promote that. We think you know, at least you ought to do that. Uh, you can do four uh, locations on a stream for about $1,000 or less. You know, this, the, uh, the project on Taylor Run for 1,900 feet was going to cost the city and the state $4.5 million. And they were going to do it without doing soil samples. Well, you know, $1,000 or $4.5 million. We just think you have to get out there and do those soil samples. And then this is, these numbers down here for water quality sampling are the numbers that we got from a contractor not far from here uh, in Ashland. We found we could get a sample for nitrogen, total phosphorus, and total suspended sediment for these dollar amounts, which again are just, you know, we used to say this is chump change compared to $4.5 million. So why jurisdictions aren't going out and doing these very simple measurements before they do a project is just, to us, like incomprehensible. Why are you not doing this? All right, so very busy slide. All I want to say here is that we went to the, the uh, city and said, hey, you know, we think there are alternatives to these stream restoration projects. I, I know you, you like them because you get big reductions based on these engineering estimates, but why don't you consider doing something like get your reductions from the Alexandria River Renew Reduction Program, which is a, um, a project to take care of their combined sewer overflow problem in the city. Uh, if they did that, they'd get a whole bunch of credits, and then if they did a tree planting project, all they'd have left to get would be a few, you know, 31 uh, uh, pounds per year of nitrogen, and they would have already satisfied everything else. So we begged the question. And so Alexandria took uh, us to heart, went out, redid their numbers, and they found that they could actually get uh, their nutrient requirements met for their permit uh, by just doing one stream restoration, that's Lucky Run, shown there in the middle, and they could get all their other reductions from other things. So it was sort of like we held them to task and they came up with alternatives. We think other jurisdictions, you know, other citizen groups should do this to their jurisdiction as well. So here's the bottom line, or sort of our summary slide. Um, extreme restoration on Taylor Run really will not improve the water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. And we certainly think the best management practices installed upstream of Taylor Run would uh, benefit the Chesapeake Bay. And I suppose the third one is my favorite, you know, we should base stream restorations on good measurements and solid science. And I'm a, I'm a guy who went to school and studied chemistry. And boy, you know, I had that beat in my head over and over again. I had an analytical chemistry teacher, a guy with a bow tie, horn rim glasses, and you know, he would just give you the hardest time if you weren't really following a rigorous scientific method. 
So to see us do the stuff where we don't base stuff on good science is really hard to, hard to take. And then finally, uh, if we do a restoration, and some are needed, you should do it in the least invasive and least uh, destructive way. Oh, I forgot to one more slide here. So millions of dollars are being spent on these stream restorations. This, the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia has already allocated uh, 52 million for these uh, projects. Uh, Montgomery County, a good friend of ours, is working on this issue in Montgomery County. They've also spent 38 million on stream restorations. And some of them are really uh, very destructive in terms of the ecological uh, destruction that they do. And um, we certainly think. So we've done our work on Taylor Run. We think other organizations, much more funded, but better funded than we are, could do studies to actually check out what we did. You know, could, could verify and uh, support the kind of work that our group did. And uh, you know, I guess I didn't mention my bio. I spent a long time uh, in my career working in the air quality program, uh, the federal air quality program working at both the state and uh, regional organizations. And in EPA's AIR program, for a state to take credit for a measure that improves air quality, the measure must be real, quantifiable, permanent, and enforceable. That's in the Clean Air Act, the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act. So that's the, the world I came from. Don't take credit for, for anything unless you can make it real, quantifiable, permanent, and enforceable. And my, my pitch would be the Chesapeake Bay deserves the same. You know, if you're going to do a project and claim credits, it better have those uh, characteristics. So that, that's a wrap up. Questions? Great. Thank you, Bill and Russ. I know we are uh, up on lunch time, but we have time for maybe one or two questions if anybody has them. When you were referring to the Pennsylvania water quality, were you referring to the Chesapeake Bay model that was giving you those figures of, for the total nitrogen and total phosphorus? So I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but maybe, expert maybe. Okay, yeah. So the expert, a uh, little background is probably needed here. So um, EPA runs the Chesapeake Bay program, and they have an expert panel that uh, is their expert panel on how to estimate reductions from streams. And, and that expert panel has this whole method that relies on the bank erosion hazard index, where engineers go out in the field, they send a survey team out in the field, they actually measure the height you know, of the banks and the angle of the banks and a whole bunch of parameters. And from that, they estimate the reductions that you'll get if you do a stream restoration of raising the, the stream bank, or the stream bed up uh, and doing other things. Uh, but it's an estimating technique that, is, uh, that EPA allows and jurisdictions use uh, in the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed, not just the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yeah, and, and, and Russ is, is, is coaching me here a little bit. Uh, Penn, they allowed the use of uh, these concentrations of phosphorus, in any case, from Pennsylvania streams until July of last year. Well, no, I'll correct myself. I think what they did is they said, now you have to do soil sampling, sampling and not just base it on these engineering uh, techniques as of July of last year. So now st stream sampling is, uh, not stream sampling, stream bank sampling is required for all restoration projects uh, going forward. Um, so, again, our, our, our sense, just a final comment, you've heard me say it before, it, if it doesn't get in the water, it doesn't get in the bay. So we think stream, sam stream bank sampling is good 
that's a step in the right direction. But we think water quality monitoring, which is cheap and easily done, is really the way to go if you really want to get nutrient uh, reductions that you can count on. Great. Don't want to stand in the way of lunch. Yeah, I know. <laughs> can I just make a point, a real quick point? Sure. Just a real quick point. When I did that study way back when, um, what the issue that local governments have is they don't own a lot of the property that where you could put the BMPs that are closer to where the water falls. And most of that property is in private ownership. So they have trouble finding the space and the land and the projects to, that they can do with, that's within their power. And so I think they fall back on these big projects that get them big credits. Um, and I love the work that you're doing. I think that's great. And then take it to the next step. Go farther up in the watershed, not just at the park, at the creek, but onto people's property and talk to all the community living around there and say, let's do some retrofits on our own property and we'll have a thousand projects. We'll make a big impact. Yeah. Hey, hey just a final follow-up on that comment. You're absolutely right. So that's true. In our case, there was room for these BMPs, but that isn't true in many places. But there is another option. You can buy credits and get them somewhere else. So there's a trading system out there that's seldom used. We think that is a, a way to actually get some BMPs in a place where you do get the reductions, where you do have space. Great. Thank you both, Bill and Russ.